Okay. Start off with just an introduction to the um, M Pharma grantees that we've been working with over the last few years. So we have uh, Tigo in Tanzania uh, working on Tigo Kilimo, Airtel in Kenya working on Airtel Kilimo, um, and uh, projects in Mali and India run by Orange and Handico, uh, all of which are information services sending agronomy tips, weather forecasts, and in some cases, market prices and livestock tips to, um, to users in those countries. Uh, you can see that each of those services has had a different level of success, um, and that's for a variety of reasons. Um, some launched later than others, um, and some have been more successful in contacting the users. But we'll, today, we'll go through some of those reasons and uh, uh, try to understand those. But overall, uh, as you can see, the um, M Farmer Initiative has reached about 1.4 million users so far. Um, so we're pretty proud of that. Um, so um, one thing we've definitely seen is, uh, and which is quite obvious, is that uh, users need to uh, become adopters of a service if they're going to gain any uh, any real benefit from that service. So. Um, although we can see 1.4 million users on uh, the registration numbers, not all of those users actually go on to, uh, after trialing the service, go on to adopt the service. And another thing we'll be looking at today is how we can bring more users along that customer journey uh, all the way through to adopting and using the service on a regular basis. So of the markets we're looking at, uh, in terms of the addressable market that was set by our grantees in each country, we can see that uh, there's still a lot of potential in these markets. 98% so of these users have not um, engaged with these services at all, giving us a, a currently current user base of about 2% of each of these addressable markets. Um, so lots of room for uh, growth and for improvement there. Um, but we can ask why these markets are so largely untapped. And we think one of those reasons is partially because nobody really knows about these services yet. Um, and the other reason is uh, that in some cases, the services are um, not sufficiently serving the customer's needs uh, in order to generate a lot of excitement. So if we look at the quality of those user bases in terms of engagement and adoption, um, Users who have engaged with the service include those who have registered and just tried the service once. And in across the board for M Pharma, that uh, accounts for uh, almost. Um, hopefully, you you can all hear me. Um, so we're leaving about twenty percent of the user base uh, adopting the service, using it multiple times. You can see a large range on that in the bottom left-hand corner, um, 19 to 81%. And that's largely because one of the services, uh, the smallest service, Airtel Kimimo, is, uh, is just a push service. Um, they don't have any, any um, content the user can go and find for themselves. Um, but the fact that it's a push service means that by our uh, categorization, it does very well. It tends to send users two or three messages a week, and that's... Uh, and thus uh, hits higher numbers of, of user adoption. So we've identified three tools of the trade which uh, we have, the MAGRI team has for, for years, been pushing as the, the, the ways to really um, improve services and help users uh, to get to that adoption point. Um, and so I'm going to tackle each of these separately. Um, first of all, value proposition, what the service is offering and how it's going to add value for users. Uh, then we're going to have a little Q&A. Uh, so please do keep your questions coming in um, and uh, so we can answer some of those and, and get some feedback from you guys. Um, the second section will be on the usability of the services and how easy it is for those users to get to, the, to what's being offered, which is obviously uh, a key part of, um, of uh, making impact on, on this user base. And thirdly, about marketing. Once you've created this great product, how do you tell everybody about it? Um, and what are the best ways of pulling users onto the service? So, start.
starting uh, talking about value propositions, the first thing that we need to do is understand the needs of our users. And there are several directions we can do this in. Um, we can uh, look from above, um, uh, and the top-down approach is to, to gather high-quality, scientific, scientifically sound information. Um, but we found that this doesn't work in isolation. Um, unless, uh, unless it's been considered very carefully, like using this raw information can lead to very low-value services. And partially this is because this content might not be what the user wants from an agri-service. If you take a look on, at the, the figure on the slide, which comes from a monitoring baseline we, we did in, the, in Kenya, you can see how, uh, how key informants from that market rank the needs of the information needs of farmers, um, starting with modern farming techniques and going down to sourcing capital, which uh, was the, the lowest ranked um, source of inf information need for, from the key informants. Uh, when we look at what farmers said they needed, in fact, it's pretty much a reverse patterning. Uh, sourcing information about sourcing capital was their primary, um, their primary need and all the other sources kind of worked in pretty much the opposite direction to what the, uh, what the experts thought. So for us, this really presses the need to go out into the market and talk to people. Um, and that's why we've been for the M Nutrition Initiative, which is the M Pharma uh, program's newest um, endeavor. We'll be working with Frog Design Team and, and already have started working with Frog design team in the countries we're working with, uh, working in, to really um, try and understand on the ground what those users, what those users need. Um, now, this doesn't cancel out the need for uh, an understanding of the agro uh, agronomic environments that you're working in in these countries, the agroclimatic zones and the lead crops in the areas um, based on seasonal cycles, but it does mean that uh, we need to talk to our user base if we want to understand what it is that they're willing to, to pay for and will really value. Um, content must be actionable, relevant, and timely. I think this is the mantra of the GSMA and Agri team, and I'm sure it's the mantra of anybody who uh, runs a content-based service. Um, actionable means, uh, means that taking a piece of information you're able to implement it practically. And we've, we've seen a problem with telephonic extension uh, in this case. Um, for example, in, in, in India, uh, the, we heard of an example where the call center advised one of their users uh, to, um, to use halogen lamps instead of chemical pesticides. Um, and this is a, an understood technique um, to certain practitioners, but not by this user who was pretty confused by the idea. And decided not to take him up on his advice. Um, now, we've seen the exact same piece of advice uh, followed by users of the uh, Green Sim iCare cell service. And when, when pushed through uh, on-the-ground extension and when uh, made more affordable by suggesting uh, the use of oil-based lamps rather than halogen lamps, we found that this behavior is very easy to follow and farmers have reported really good results. Um, so I guess... That illustrates the, the need for um, for the engagement to be something not too far away from what a user is expecting, especially over the phone, and for uh, the method occasionally to be to be um, presented in the flesh and not just for, uh, from some voiceless uh, or faceless person over the phone. Um, other ways we've seen lack of of, uh, of relevance or, or uh, actionability in content have been, um, for example, using a, an alphabet which users are not familiar with. So uh, it's a technology problem for uh, basic phones in India that they are not able to uh, reproduce Hindi characters. Uh, but if we write if SMS to uh, users who only speak Hindi in the, using the English alphabet, many are not able to read them uh, due to low levels of education in the user base. Um, content must also be complete um, and, and must be able to be acted upon. Um, and as I said, there are certain, certain types of information uh, that maybe the phone is not the right medium to, to convey. Um, the, the picture on this slide shows 
a time time that we spent in a village outside Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, um, running through with uh, this lady whose name is Miriam, uh, the process that would take her from um, calling uh, from the very beginning of uh, selling a crop at market to the to very end. And at the beginning of this process, you can see on the cards here, she calls her, the, her, um, the boss, the guy she's going to sell to, and he comes in the car, they talk, and then she goes out to find laborers. Incidentally, this was the point of, the, um, of this uh, process that she found most difficult. Um, and then after more negotiations, harvesting is, occurs and uh, um, transport is loaded up, everyone is paid, and then, uh, and then the man leaves. So that's what you can see in the picture. And um, you can see right at the front of this process is a, a, picture, a little picture of a mobile service. And that's the ideal market pricing service for Miriam, the one that tells her what's going on at local markets so that she can um, use that to influence her decisions. But the actual service as it stood was, was not able to provide that information. Um, the markets it was able to tell her about were far away. Um, they didn't tell her, give her enough information about um, about what type of crop was being discussed, and they also uh, didn't uh, necessarily convey the information in a way that she could understand. For example, uh, measuring in kilos as opposed to in the sacks that she would she would be used to. Um, but we can take a look at what content has been popular on uh, on the various services that we've been running. So. This, uh, this graph pertains to the MKSAN service in India. You can say that, see, there's been some variation throughout different quarters in the type of information that people have been accessing. By far and away, over most quarters, market price information has been the most popular uh, to access, um, except for a, a big spike during Q4 2013, uh, where users were accessing crops advisory and livestock advisory. Um, looking at the market pricing information is really interesting, I think, uh, in terms of this customer journey we've been talking about. Um, the repeat users of the HandyGo service uh, were using the market pricing information much more than other people, and they were using it at times of the season when it was most relevant to them. So between January and March 2014, 40% of those repeat users were able to pull market price information as opposed to 5% of trial users. And 100% uh, of the requests for the top 10 crops for that period were from um, repeat users. So this shows us that uh, repeat users are, are the ones who are the savvy ones who are able to, to, uh, to make the service work for them. Uh, um, so in terms of time of the season, uh, we find within this service that planning content is much more popular than other kinds of content, um, especially within the crop advisory. Within livestock advisory, um, the opposite pattern really, the disease information is far more um, requested than, uh, than any other type of information. So um, <laughs> I believe more testing needs to be done on this service to understand what it is about these different types of content, which makes it easy for people to access them. But there is a message here around the way that you're tagging your data um, within a mobile service. If you're able to tag your content uh, consistently and with at this level of granularity, then you can really learn a lot about the patterns within uh, user behavior, which for some of the services we work with, we're just not able to do. Um, Um, in terms of what content is actionable, um, most users reported they were able to use agronomy content uh, for this service, so over half of, of those users. Um, and we saw a similar pattern with, uh, in, within Tigo Kilimo. Um, people were also able to act on the market price information. We see that 29% of users uh, interviewed reported a benefit from uh, improved income or better prices. And one other thing we've noticed is that uh, the value of a product um, is, uh, is very heavily influenced by market, marketing, and this is something 
we'll be talking about uh, later on in another section. We just wanted to show you here um, that uh, the popularity of agronomy tips within Tigo Kilimo really spiked after a, uh, after a marketing campaign, uh, which, which uh, told users about that produce, and then, and then dropped down again after that time when uh, um, people, it turned out people were probably seeking something different. And again, this point is kind of more about marketing, but I thrown it in here. Uh, you really, one thing we haven't seen people do is is show them the value of all of this uh, work that's been put in from the top-down perspective. Um, uh, in terms of uh, crop calendars and understanding exactly where that farmer is likely to be in their season. So, if it's August, it's time to be packing and storing your grain. Um, marketing could focus on advice around safely packaging that, that, uh, rice, that rice for storage and for nutritional information um, nutritional information about that product, for example. Now, we've seen that users like to try before they buy, and we see this in a really stark way with uh, the Tigo Kilimo data set. Um, as you see, low levels of use were pretty low, um, around 30,000 users in total for the first uh, over a year, um, until the service was improved, uh, in February 2014, but also uh, offered free of charge to the user base and uh, marketed as such, an enormous spike in the um, in the number of users accessing uh, occurred at that point. Um, but will customers pay for that content? Well, 80% of users we asked said that they would after they tried it, um, but it just seemed to be that initial freemium push that uh, pulled those users onto the service. So, what makes users value a service? The first thing that I think we've learned over the last few years is that we need to ask them uh, and in order to choose relevant and actionable content for a target market. And I think there's a really big challenge in there for service providers. Um, how, do you, um, how do you go from this very sort of top-down information um, to understanding exactly what that particular user is going to want. Um, some services that we know of do that through profiling their users in a very specific way, so understanding exactly where they are, exactly what crops they're interested in. Um, but those things are timely uh, they, they, and probably and also expensive. So are there any other ways that we can use to, um, to understand the target markets that we're dealing with? Um, we talked about how a freemium model gives users a taste of the service and really helps them to um, to see the value before they're being asked to put down any um, money, which is a valuable, a precious commodity. Um, a pricing scheme which users understand and feel is good value is integral, um, and we've found uh, in some situations um, that's not the case. If users aren't clear what they're spending money on, it, it doesn't uh, breed trust in, in their base, and that's a problem. Um, and later we'll talk about marketing, which relates to the value of the service, uh, especially through storytelling. Um, so that concludes the first section of the presentation. Um, I see we have some, some questions. Um, uh, so Judy's asked whether we're able to um, differentiate between the Indian service and those in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, as something we're interested in doing in the in the long run, Judy, and, and what we're kind of presenting here is a, a bit of an interim um, finding session, I guess. Uh, we haven't yet had a chance to really aggregate this data. So each of the um, each of the slides that I've shown you here are relevant to one specific service. Um, but um, available on our resources website are case studies for each of the individual services, and uh, an aggregated uh, paper will. Uh, come out later in the year. Um, okay. um, Georgia asked whether we included information that wasn't specifically agricultural. Um, we don't have any information services which combine agriculture with football, but uh, we do have um, services where other information is available. Um, MKSAN in India is part of a larger service called uh, Beta Zindagi, which uh, includes information about health, education, um, and it really is a, an enormous service. 
like in an encyclopedia on a phone. Um, we didn't track information outside of agriculture in this instance, um, but I think you're right in that it would be interesting to um, compare the beta Zundigi users to the control group and see whether there's a difference where users are able to access uh, information of lots of different kinds. Um, Sid Ram asked me whether Tigo Kilimo usage dropped back uh, after after the spike due to a reintroduction of the usage fee. Uh, no, there was no reintroduction of a usage fee at that point. Um, we'll go on to talk about some of the service design problems we saw with Tigo Kilimo, um, which we think made it very difficult and time consuming for users to access information. Um, we also think that uh, the service was not marketed. Uh, particularly strongly after that initial push, and that users, um, having not been able to easily access information the first time round, uh, weren't, weren't well incentivized to return and, and have another look at the service. Yeah. Okay, um, I think we'll move on to the next uh, section of the presentation. So we're going to be talking about usability here. Um, First thing to consider when thinking about the usability of a service is um, the barriers within your user base in terms of the channels you choose. So working with um, non-smart, non-feature phones, you're pretty limited in, in terms of what kind of service you're able to supply. Um, but one that we've seen uh, happening quite a lot in our, in, uh, within our grantees are USSD and SMS-based services, which definitely present a barrier to illiterate users. We see um, um, literacy rates of around 70% across, um, across three of the countries we're working in, especially in Mali, um, very low levels of literacy. And in Mali, Orange decided to start um, running their service uh, with the call center, um, which was aimed at, um, in, uh, at getting rid of that um, illiteracy barrier. Um, on the subject of USSD, we all know that there are technology problems with these services, but uh, with, with USSD services, but sometimes you need to see it in the field to really believe how difficult it is to, um, to work with some of these services. Um, and as you can see from the figures here, the average number of timeouts um, between yeah. The average number of timeouts uh, for a user to register for Tigo Kilimo was four and a half timeouts. So that would mean the phone turning on, uh, the, the signal being lost four, four times or over the course of a uh, almost 15 minute period uh, in order to register for this service. Um, uh, the people we, we spoke to and the people who, who uh, did this testing for us, assured us that if they were on their own, they would have continued uh, trying and trying again to use the service. But we weren't 100% convinced that that was the truth. Um, people got better and better, though, as they, as they did continue. And, and by the time they were accessing information, it was taking less than half that time to, um, to get to the information itself. But that still involved two timeouts over a seven and a half minute period. So, um, yeah, we still thought it was a very difficult, um, a very difficult way to get information. And one way that we think you could improve on this is to personalize the service more. So as I was saying at the end of the previous section, to have a build an understanding of what it is that person is likely to want to access so that you can make those menus shorter. And uh, yeah. Yeah, make those menus shorter. I think that is my next slide. Um, so each time you add another sub menu, uh, you lose a third of the people on the on the line. Um, so we found. Um, so by the time you get to the fourth sub menu, um, you've got a very very small percentage of your original uh, number of users uh, are likely to have stayed on the line. Um, and some of our services, this would seem to be a big problem. Um, Mkisan in India has, as I've already said, has an IVR menu which is expansive and covers a huge amount of ground, um, but it would take a very long time on the phone 
um, uh, in some cases to get to especially the least the less popular crops as the menus are ordered by um, popularity of uh, other service users. We've also seen some um, some service design issues within the services, as I said. So um, within Tigo Kilimo, uh, there an issue. There was an issue of, of delivering information, uh, largely because the information that users have requested wasn't available. So this was a problem of a lack of dynamism in the content delivery system. So the menus would always be available, but the content would not. Um, and having fixed this problem. After um, around the same time as the service was made free of charge, which makes it difficult for us to understand what the real cause of that um, that uh, spike in usage was, um, we saw that problem fixed and the service delivery became much better. And I guess this is a, another good reason to just keep an eye on your data to understand um, how well you're doing in terms of serving your customers' needs. Um, we saw in some cases that service design, um, I guess this goes back to something I was saying a couple of slides ago, but the design of the services really influences the way that these users um, are able to reach content. Um, especially if these users are low literacy uh, or low technical literacy, it, it is um, sometimes they haven't come across an IVR menu before. Um, and when they do, maybe the notion of Touching one or two or three is, is not 100% uh, obvious to them. So uh, what we see here on this graph is that uh, whatever was at the top of the IVR menu for a certain month received by far and away uh, the most attention, um, except for in the case of August when market prices were at the top of the menu. But I think we saw a general slump in, um, in listenership during that period. Um, so yes, uh, in this case, the the way that the HandyGo tried to personalize the service, or not personalize, but at least make it somewhat dynamic, was to use the um, most used type of content from the previous month to influence what was at the top of the IVR menu, um, which um, it's um, difficult to say whether that worked out well because uh, we had we have no feedback based on uh, an actual user experience. But it does seem to us that perhaps uh, the users are guided by the menu more than by what it is they actually really wanted to, to get to. Helplines uh, have been proffered by many of the services that we are working with. And some of the new services we're working with as well intend to have quite extensive helplines, which is great. I mean, it's what all the users want. Uh, they want to speak to a person who can really address their exact problem and it's probably a, it's a very very easy way to personalize a service. But it's also very difficult to scale. Um, the capacity is ne necessary to reach um, a user base of, uh, say in the case of HandyGo here, we have, um, by the end we have 800,000 users and the number of, total number of calls uh, that it successfully can handle in a month tops out at about 450. So. Uh, although this was kind of a pilot scale helpline, um, it just goes to show that uh, it's it's difficult to reach a lot of people um, with this method. And perhaps a better way of using the helpline would be to uh, target it for much more uh, emergency situations. So, um, if you need a, if it's a veterinary emergency or a or a pest based emergency, um, a helpline might be a great way of getting people exactly the kind of information that they seek in those difficult situations. So some lessons around service usability, um, around choosing appropriate channels for your target audience and remembering the limits of those technologies. And also in that case, in the case of USSD, remembering that although we know that uh, USSD timeout is a part of the process and, and that you need to try again, um, users in and rural Tanzania were not aware of this and uh, assumed a service was broken when perhaps they had just reached the limit of the connection time. Um, keeping menus short by personalizing the service as much as possible um, it would be a real, a real um, bonus. And 
it's not something that we've seen uh, done too much within M Pharma. Um, user testing of the service is vital to understanding where these problems are and how to uh, eliminate them. And helplines can deliver great value, but they do need to be carefully positioned. So if anyone has any questions or feedback about uh, service usability, it would, be, um, it would be great to have your questions. I think we have one question on the line about um, whether the rising penetration of smartphones uh, will eliminate the usability problems for USSD-based uh, applications. Um, I think that's a, that's a good question. It's certainly we need to be looking to the future with these kinds of services, it seems to me, um, especially in more advanced markets like India, where uh, the Green Sim guys report that about half of their user base is web-ready. They've got feature phones or beyond. So definitely getting past the point where we can uh, afford not to think about this. Um, I think definitely the potential is there for smartphones to eliminate a lot of these problems, for example, um, by using um, icons instead of words or by uh, uh, using multimedia content. Um, I think, and I think the and women team at the GSMA have done some good work on ways that that could possibly uh, that could possibly work out. So that's definitely worth taking a look at. There's no more questions on the line. We'll move on to talking about marketing strategy. Um, so back in 2011, when we published a, a, a market entry toolkit. Um, we we, uh, we came up with this way of uh, splitting up the user base and along the customer journey, and we talked about how different stages of this process might require different ways of communicating with the customer. So starting uh, when users are unaware with uh, a bigger scale campaign with face-to-face -face campaigning, explaining how something will work, and including national campaigns on TV and radio, um, and then through a process of teaching users and incentivizing users, um, through freemium models, uh, and maybe through packaging and bundles, um, and loyalty rewards as you get towards the adoption end. And really, I guess this is about making a, a, a real part of your strategy and, and incentivizing it in the same way as you would incentivize any other uh, type of, of service. And so at the unaware phase, we really saw, um, we saw success in this area when uh, looking at Senekella in Mali. Um, two uh, sets of video spots within a couple of weeks of the service really launching. Uh, and we can see a huge spike in usage, um, up to 80,000 accesses for their USSD service within the first couple of months of launching. Um, and the way that they did this was to... Um, was to... How did they do it? Oh, yes. They did loads of research around, um, around looking at local radio stations, what kind of uh, programming agriculturalists would tune into ordinarily, and picking those spots where they knew they would have the, the biggest impact on their target audience. When we talk about the education stage of campaigning, um, we're talking about educating users, and especially doing that through face-to-face -face, uh, marketing. Um, we think educating users uh, really requires also educating your uh, agent network. So without um, people who, are, and who understand and are incentivized to push those products, um, there will be very limited chance of success. Um, and on the graph here, you can see the user bases that were generated by two different uh, marketing campaigns, one of which was an SMS blast and one of which was a marketing event. And in this case, uh, the marketing event generated a slightly higher quality, um, a slightly higher quality user base, um, we can see by looking at the customer journey. But in fact, it, this wasn't in every, this, it, this wasn't the case in each case that we looked at here. There were SMS blasts which created a better user base than marketing events. And one of the reasons we think this is, is that um, in most cases that we saw through M Pharma, there wasn't this, uh, there wasn't this 
great incentive for agent networks to sign people up to these services. Um, so we saw, we didn't see a huge amount of this face-to-face -face, um, education going ahead. Um, and there was a lot of potential um, in attending agricultural events and cross-selling different kinds of products, so SIMs and mobile money and VAST to this user base who really are some of the really untapped people. Um, in terms of uh, an agent network, we're, we're talking about um, who an operator has available to go out and talk to users. But we've seen great successes with other kinds of um, other kinds of uh, service providers really tapping into other types of, um, of educators out there in the market. So ITSL have worked very strongly with uh, other NGOs who already have um, farmer networks on the ground and who already have ways of, of communicating with them in the field um, in order to push the service and to help them to understand exactly how the service works. Um, so that's also been a really successful method. We would um, hope to see cases in the future where a properly incentivized force were able to make a really big difference uh, to the number of users actively and adopting a service. Last SMS, uh, USSD attached. Uh, and outbound dialing have been some of the most popular methods that we've seen uh, among our four services to get to attract new users. Um, as a method of attracting new users, we're not sure whether this is uh, really exactly the right way to go, um, especially because messages would uh, often be quite generic. Um, things like uh, for farming information, dial this short code, um, which we didn't find particularly persuasive, and I don't think a large number of the potential user base did either. Um, what you can see here on the on the slide is um, a number of grouped users uh, of one of the services. Um, and you can see the initial blast SMS that goes out at day zero, and how long it takes a lot of those user groups to uh, return to the service and access it. You can see those rows running along at day 75 uh, and around day 150, which show um, a scattering of new users around those times. And uh, we think that this shows quite nicely and illustrates um, how well SMS can act as a reminder to people. It's a very cheap way to get back to service, potential service users and say, hey, remember us? Um, yes, so, and, and to invite people back to the service in that way. Uh, another way that we've found um, similar, I guess, to using NGOs is to spread the trust of other users, other farmers who um, by far and away are the largest influence on the way that users who we've spoken to in the field uh, make decisions on their farm, to use um, the acumen that they already have uh, to draw in other users. Um, this has been done in this case by, by a really simple refer, refer a friend method um, within a service menu. Um, now, the fact that it's tucked away in the menu is a little bit uh, of a downside because only at this point uh, this graph was made, only around 6,000 users had actually managed to find the refer a friend um, um, button. But once they'd found it, they... Um, generated a slightly higher quality user base than, than the rest of the service. So slightly more of those users are coming back. Um, and 5% and, and there's that additional 5 percentage points are actually trying the service at all, which is probably the biggest barrier in this case to getting users to adopt. Um, so this it seems like it's got the potential to be an effective method. So we've seen... Um, well researched traditional marketing do really well, um, and a trained and, and properly incentivized agent, uh, agent workforce. Partnering with organizations who already have uh, other agents and farmer groups in the right areas, and uh, using SMS, USSD, and OBD marketing to complement that, as well as recruiting brand ambassadors who will evangelize these services. 
we have a couple of questions on the line. Um, someone asked, asked me to clarify how we were suggesting using the crop calendars for marketing activities. Um, I think what we're driving at here is just to um, to make the most of those uh, crop calendars and other kinds of resources which kind of give you expertise in the agricultural world, but which, um, um, yes, yeah, which you can point towards through short messaging. So, um, for example, I could send out uh, an engagement message to users which said, um, for farming information or for weather forecasting, uh, dial this short code. Or I could send out uh, a message which said, um, it's going to rain on Tuesday, um, so I suggest that, that uh, using fertilizer on your crops now would be a, this would be an excellent way of boosting an early harvest. Um, so, out of those two, I think one shows a level of of understanding of your user base and really utilizes uh, the probably the the money and resources that went into creating that crop calendar, and obviously. It's not to give away all your information like this, but it's sort of offering a freemium model and bringing the users into a more trusting relationship with your service by showing them that you have relevant information to offer. Another question on the line asks whether we've seen any good examples of incentive systems for agent networks. And I think we can look to the broader market to find some, some really uh, really good ideas about how to incentivize agents, um, including um, having a split, a, split, uh, a split way of rewarding those users in terms of um, how, they're, how they're paid. So we can say, uh, okay, we want those uh, agent network to collect a quantity of users, so we can give them targets around how many users they collect. Uh, we can also use a um, something like the customer journey methodology to understand the quality of those users they generate. Um, and so by that method, um, we can also incentivize users. And we can also use this, uh, these methods of tagging to understand which uh, agents or which ambassadors for the service are doing the best job of, of, doing, uh, of collecting quality users. And we can approach them to understand how they're going about doing that and uh, what makes them a, a great asset to the service so that other, other, um, other agents can benefit from their methods and also get higher bonuses because of uh, their learning. So I'm also asked on the line, in the refer a friend model, are any incentives provided to users for successful follow on sign up? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. I know that, um, that in other services we have seen brand ambassadors um, who are just usual users of the service, but who also can be taken on in the capacity of, of agents to sign up other users. Uh, in the case of Tigo Kalimo, I think there is no incentive provided, but maybe it's a good idea to offer some kind of free uh, package or extra um, content for users um, who, who do refer other users to the service. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm asked whether IKSA in India has an effective agent workforce, and uh, yes, I think it does. Um, so I can just briefly outline how that works for you. Um, they take a, an approach which uses several um, from several different angles. So they have uh, an agent network which is trained as part of uh, their IFCO branches. So um, there we have uh, permanent members of staff within IKSL who go out and find people to um, to go out into the world and train agents. And they are, uh, I'm not sorry, not train agents, and, and attract users. And they are awarded, as I said, on this um, half based on quantity and half based on quality of the user base. They also have brand ambassadors, as I mentioned, the uh, Kisan Mitra, who are uh, farmers' friends, who are local respected farmers. Um, and thirdly, they have uh, the usual um, method of distributing SIMs via um, shops and other, uh, through the mobile network, um, through the network of 
mobile operator agents who um, are likewise incentivized to sell that product as a, one of a number of other airtel and other products. Um, so this would be the only option available or the only option used by some uh, operators, but we have been told by the guys at IKSL that it's not necessarily the best method uh, all on its own because these, uh, these agents are incentivized by a number of different people and you're not always sure that you can uh, be the one who's, who's giving them the best price and you might end up getting into a bit of a bidding war there, which uh, might not be the most effective method of attracting new customers. One last question on the line around advertising from input suppliers in return for marketing activities and whether this is something that we would consider. Um, I think there's, there's definite pros and cons to, to that approach. Um, uh, pros would be that you might be able to utilize existing networks uh, of input suppliers as an early uh, kickoff for um, a group of farmers who would be your initial user base. Um, I think it might, um, yeah, there's a possibility that it wouldn't, yeah, necessarily, well, <laughs> no, I can't think of any cons, let's say, still pros. <laughs> so thanks for that question. Um, maybe we'll just move on to the end of the presentation now and then we'll see whether there's any extra questions on the line in case you, uh, you missed your chance earlier on. We'll see what, what else we can, uh, what else we have to say. Um, Oh, that looks like the last slide. Um, so I just, it looks like I wanted to show everybody uh, where the resources, uh, you can find lots more information about the M Pharma services on the MAGRI website under the resources tab, which is on the left hand side. And you'll find very deep dive uh, case studies from monitoring and evaluation reports there on the website. Um, so before we close up, we'll just see if there's any more questions on the line. Um, so one, Person the line is asking, as an MNO, what benefits can I expect when developing an M Agri VAS? Uh, which is a, a good question. Um, we obviously um, see a huge amount of potential in the agricultural uh, in the ag agricultural world around um, users who have not yet been signed up by mobile operators, but who uh, um, have the potential to be to be customers of certain. Services. So, yeah. Um, so uh, there's a huge untapped user base there, and as the, the GSMA predicted a few years ago now, the, the next billion users are likely to be uh, rural people um, from these uh, less privileged backgrounds. So this is uh, one way of really tapping into that market. Um, other incentives for operators would include indirect benefits like um, churn reduction, We've seen uh, in services, um, not necessarily agricultural services, but other vast services like this. Um, for example, HNI in Madagascar report uh, a large increase in loyalty to their services after after starting to run um, educational services like this. So, definite indirect benefits in terms of um, loyalty as well. Um, so, just one last thing to say, I guess, really, and that's that. Um, the MAGRI team are very interested in uh, hearing more about your services, and we're running a, an update of our deployment tracker. That'll be a completely new look and a new feel on the website, uh, and so we're excited about showing you that um, in the coming months. Uh, but if you would like your service to be um, featured on that tracker, or whether you just want to tell us a little bit more about what's been going on with your service, then please do let me know. Send me an, uh, an email or email mAGRI at gsma.com. Um, and this presentation, uh, in case you want to listen to it again, or in case uh, in case anyone you know missed it, uh, we will be uploading it as a separate presentation, and we'll also be uploading a written document uh, containing the same kinds of insights for all of you guys. So uh, I think we'll break a little bit early, as we don't have any more questions on the line. So thanks all very much for coming, and. Uh, yeah, we'll uh, we'll be in touch. Thanks very much.